Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here with y'all and to be a part of this gospel meeting, uh, even if it is with Brother Gibson as the other speaker. <laughs> I'm kidding. He's enjoying it. Be around. You know, Cody said that um, there was three of us here, so I'm giving him a hard time. There's actually four of us. Me, Rachel, Jack, and baby girl to be here soon at the moment. So technically that's four, because that's the whole argument against abortion, right? Uh, the fact that she's living already. So anyway, uh, as we um, begin, we're going to piggyback off a moment for a moment the, the service emphasis there. What is the greatest service that we can do for people? The Teach them the gospel, right? Every other service that we do is for the purpose of the gospel. Now, obviously, we serve one another as Christians, but you know we're saved and we're trying to help each other get to heaven. But then, on the other side, the other side of things, when we're serving people who are outside of Christ, it's to get them to to have Bible study with us. Right? That is our ultimate goal. If they are outside of Christ, now obviously we we do our, we are serving for the benefit of serving too. But again. It's to bring them the good news. So with that being the case, uh, I'm going to do one question for a Bible class, and the rest is going to be the sermon, all right? What is your understanding of personal evangelism? Any thoughts, comments? What is your understanding for personal evangelism? You are seeking those opportunities, and you are trying to create the opportunity to teach some of the gospel. That's personal, right? What I want to do before we actually get into the meat of the sermon, I want to consider this topic and give some brief ideas that you and I already probably know, but then we want to talk about how we do it, or maybe the challenges of evangelism. Because whenever we consider this topic, we're dealing with a topic that is absolutely essential to the health and growth of the Lord's church in every community, even here. So what is personal evangelism? Simply put, personal evangelism is taking the work of sowing and watering the seed of the kingdom personally. Taking the work of sowing and watering the seed of the kingdom personally so that God may give the increase, as he says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, and... Again, we need to understand it is a command that every Christian should be doing, Mark 16, 15. Additionally, personal evangelism is serving others. You know, the Apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5. He says, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus. And he says, and we are your bondservants for Jesus' sake. Right? We're preaching Christ and we're serving you for his sake, is what he's saying in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5. And it's that old saying that we probably have heard multiple times. People do not care how much we know unless they know how much we care, right? People do not care how much we know unless they know how much we care. Again, we may serve our neighborhoods. We may do that physically. But ultimately, our true service is teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost, Galatians 1.10. And in doing so, we show them how much we care because we want them to be saved, because we want them to be in eternity with us. Additionally, personal evangelism is listening. Personal evangelism is listening. As we listen to others, we demonstrate our care and concern for them. Consider Jesus for a moment. Jesus was the master teacher because he was the master at listening. He was the master teacher because he was the master at listening. For example, one of the most iconic one of evangelism, but even the conversation, is Jesus and the woman at the well, right? John 4. That was able to happen because trust was established and due to part of Jesus' willingness to listen and to reply based upon what was said. And so whenever you consider that, we need to follow Jesus in that way because he was willing to listen and then reply. A lot of times we're trying to just attack right you're wrong this is why you're wrong but listen and then reply 
And finally, personal evangelism is using our knowledge, skill, and motivation to succeed in soul winning. It is using our knowledge, skill, and motivation to succeed in soul winning. In 1 Peter 3, verse 15, a passage we probably know well, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with, with meekness and fear. Friends, the truth is, is we are able to answer because of knowledge. We are able to give a defense because of skill. And we're always ready and willing to do that because of motivation. Brethren, we can know the Bible in its entirety. We can know it completely. But if we're not motivated to, if we're not motivated to share it, or if we cannot or will not share it with the right skill, then our knowledge is useless, right? If, in other words, if we come with the wrong attitude, the wrong heart, maybe in the wrong way, it doesn't matter how much you know, right? And so we're dealing with a topic that is personal. Uh, raise your hand if you feel comfortable teaching some of the gospel. I would say I feel comfortable, but because I've done it for a while now. That's my, that's my work at, at Southwest, is literally evangelism and a few other things, but mainly evangelism. But it didn't begin that way. It did not begin that way. So it's fair to admit that there are some challenges that come with the work of personal evangelism. And so in pre preparation for this lesson, I asked Christians, what are the challenges that you deal with? And, and we're going to apply this to Jesus as well, and we'll talk about this as well. But what are the, the challenges that you deal with as a Christian as you try to teach someone the gospel? To my surprise, there are many different challenges, and there are some that I would expect, and there are some that I would have not expected. And we're going to put these in categories, and then we're going to talk about them. We're going to give some advice on how we can overcome the challenges. So the first one is this, challenge of exclusion. The challenge of exclusion. You know, whenever we consider this challenge, immediately our mind goes to the fact that we are scared of a negative response. We are scared of a negative response because in a society that is all about acceptance, the truth is we do not want to experience a negative response. It does not make us feel good. It is very uncomfortable to deal with the, the nature of that. You know, I find uh, yesterday the students and I went out door knocking. It was the end of their quarter, and that's what we do at the end of the quarter, go door knocking. And we split up into three large groups, and we went to different parts of Austin. And Austin, for the most part, I mean, you're probably saying liberal, right? You're probably not going to get a lot of good luck there, right, trying to knock people's door. A lot of people didn't answer the door. A lot of their signs said no soliciting. But within that, we found three good contacts. Three people who opened their door and we talked to them. We were able to have a good five minute discussion with them. One of the ladies shared that she had just gone through uh, her, one of her, um, sorry, one of her relatives had just committed suicide. Good opportunity right here. Committed suicide. And we said, well, can we pray for you? She said, yes, I'd love to pray for you. Can we send you cards of compassion? Yes. Can I bring you a book next week on coping and maybe dealing with this and maybe get somebody to talk to you, uh, talk for you, or talk to talk to you about this, maybe your struggle, what's going on? She said yes. That whole two hours that we're out for one person, and there's two other ones that that uh, were good contacts, that was my, the story with me there. I don't recall, I don't know how theirs went, but they told me that they were good and they're gonna go back and visit them. But my point is, is Two hours, one soul, follow up. It was a lot of rejection before that. That was a lot of people closing the door, I'm not interested, you're probably trying to sell me something, right? That's my point I'm trying to make. It's, we, didn't, we don't want to feel rejection, but if you want to feel rejection, go knock on people's doors. You know, as Christians, we read about the rejection of the Old Testament prophets. We've read about the rejection of the apostles. We've read about the rejection of the first century Christians. We even read about the rejection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And yet we still fear 
a negative response. Friends, this is a real life Christian struggle that is for the young and for the old. So how can we overcome this? How can we overcome the, the fear of a negative response? First, I would say remind yourself why Jesus considered it important to come to earth. Why did Jesus come to earth? Luke 19, 10. I came to seek and save the lost. That was his purpose. Seek and save the lost. And that should be our purpose as well. In writing to the young, Tim, the young preacher Timothy, the apostle Paul expressed that truth like this. In 1 Timothy 1, 15. He said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, I am the chief. What about this one? Romans 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What was his purpose? Saving souls. What's a Christian's purpose? Saving souls. But even, even just for a moment, do we truly believe what those passages say? That it's important to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because the reason Jesus came is the same reason why, why we're here, why we exist. To teach people the gospel to help one another get to heaven, right? So then why are we scared of a negative response? I'm not saying I'm not. I'm saying it gets easier as you go through it, the more you do it. In the beginning, I definitely was. Additionally, to overcome the fear of a negative response, we must also consider the fact that it would not be against us, but against God. This is why our Lord made it clearly known that he who hears, he who rejects you, sorry, he who hears you, I'm going to get this right one time, he who hears you hears me, he who hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me, Luke, Luke 10, 16. The gospel according to John adds, he who does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day, John 12, verse 48. And in the gospel according to Matthew, Matthew 10, 14, this is what Christ said. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, he says to do what? Shake off the dust off your feet. In other words, go on to the next. Don't waste your time dwelling on that one person who rejected you. There are more souls to save. Right? Just, there's more souls to save than just in that one city or that one house. Therefore, continue to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, especially if someone rejects you. So knowing those verses, where's the power of God in his word? Knowing those verses, do we truly believe that people reject the, the words of Christ and not us? And if we do, why are we afraid of a negative response? Next, when it comes to the challenge of exclusion, there's also the fear of losing friends, right? There's the fear of losing friends. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. None of us really want to lose our friendships. None of us really want to lose our personal relationships with our, our family members, maybe. And if you're like me, somebody who's converted from a denomination, I, con I converted from Catholicism, and for the first five, seven years of my Christian life, my, my family really didn't want much to do with me, right? And I, it was hard to be around them. But then again, you ask yourself the same question. If that is us, and we don't really want to lose our friends or our family members, we have to understand what Christ says. In Matthew 10, 37, he said this, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Here we learn that there is a cost when it comes to following Jesus. And it's going to be personal. When it comes to evangelism, if our family or friends reject Christ, the words of Christ, and reject us because of it, then there's a choice that we have to make. Obedience to Christ or fear, fear of exclusion. And that's a choice that we have to make. And sadly, it's a, it's a choice that many Christians fall short of. Therefore, how can we overcome the fear of losing 
personal relationships. Let, let's turn to this one. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13 and 14. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13 and 14. We'll read it in just a moment. Raise your hand if you believe you're saved. You probably wouldn't be if you didn't, right? Believe you're saved. When it comes to evangelism, we must believe in the word of God and our salvation because not speaking equals disbelief. Notice what he says here. In the context, Paul has just mentioned the power of the word in him and his co-workers. He just mentioned the hardships that they endured and the constant threat of death for preaching the truth. He says, but it accomplished life in the converts. And this is what he says. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise up raise us up with Jesus and will be present will present us with you. Two things to consider here. First, our faith is to be a spoken faith. It's not to be held within. If we truly believe in the glorious gospel of Christ that saved us and which we were obedient to, then he says we're going to speak it. Because believing equals speaking, right? And speaking equals believing. So if you believe that you're saved, what are you going to do about it? You're going to speak it. That's what saved you. Right? When we consider this fact right here, he also tells us this second point. Speaking is to be done with the assurance or the expectation that hardships or persecutions will follow, but we do it anyways. Right? We know that not everybody's going to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if we believe we're saved, we're going to speak it. In our, in, our, in our obedience to the word of God, do we truly believe that we have salvation? And in our obedience to the word of God, do we, be, do we believe that as we keep teaching people, we'll be saved? Again, th I'm not saying that you need to go out and you need to teach 100 people and you're going to be saved or 200 people or just constantly be baptizing people because that's not a reality. But what I'm saying is, is that let me say it like this. How many of us know 10 people that are not, that are not Christians? Maybe 10, 10 people that are not Christians in the community. They're your contacts. I, I notice here we have 45 people. Let's just say 40. That's 400 contacts that you have in your pews of people that y'all can be talking to, that you can be trying to teach. And even if you just taught four of them this year, the number will grow. It's not about numbers, though, but it'll grow, right? My point is, is we all know somebody that's not a Christian. And if you don't, if you say you don't, look in your phone. I bet you scroll through your phone, you probably will find 10 people that are not Christians. So again, if we believe that we're saved, we will speak to them. So that's the challenge of exclusion, but there's also the challenge of experience. Whenever we consider this challenge, immediately we may think about maybe a lack of knowledge. Maybe that's you. Maybe you are afraid that you do not know enough. And, and as a result, you're afraid that you're going to do more harm than good in evangelism. Allow me simply to say first that if you approach people with love in your hearts, there's no way you're going to do more harm than good. But secondly... The best way to learn to evangelize is by getting out and teaching people the gospel. It's not an unforgivable sin to say that you do not know the answer in the middle of a Bible, the middle of a Bible study, right? We, we use Back to the Bible by Southwest. I see y'all use y'all have the Back to the Bible here. That's an easy way of teaching people the gospel, where you let the Word of God speak, and then they understand. You just guide them through it. Right? But my point is, is, is we don't need to know everything to teach them the gospel. Again, we all believe we're saved. How? We all obeyed the gospel. We can all, we can all say that, that the gospel is, 1 Corinthians 15, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We can all say that 
you are obedient to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, 3 and following, that you are, you are uh, dead to your sins, you're buried with Christ, and then you're raised up into newness of life, right? We, we all understand that. So then why is it hard to teach that? So this leads to the second point, uh, I mean, the, the, the application of this point. How do we overcome the lack of knowledge? I would say that we need to study and grow in the, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18. As newborn babes, that is, as young Christians, the command is that we are to desire the pure milk of the Lord that you may grow up into salvation, 1 Peter 2, verse 2. Well, what about this one? By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the author of Hebrews said this. He said, for, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, and yet you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. He said, you need milk, not solid food, Hebrews 5, verse 12. So from that passage, we learned that there comes a time when God expects us to grow beyond the basic principles of Christianity. Would you say that when you became a Christian, that was basic knowledge? Absolutely, right? That's basic knowledge to us. And he says you're to grow past that time. He's not telling everybody that everybody needs to be a preacher, a teacher, in a Bible class or anything like that. But he's saying that there comes a time when every single, every single Christian ought to be teachers and teach those basic principles. To give people the milk of the word help them help them grow right not to know everything in the word but teach the basic principles again we all believe we're saved we all understood the basic the basic principles of the word of God so if you knew that you know enough to teach them the gospel right that's a fair that's a fair conclusion we would say but again, maybe this is something we know. So then why is it that we are not doing it? Why is it that we don't do it? It may be that we're not challenging ourselves. We're not challenging ourselves. And this leads to another reason for the challenge of experience, a lack of confidence. You know, a lot of people are intimidated by evangelism because they're not confident in it, right? They're not confident that they can do it. But the truth is, is that no one is a natural born soul winner. No one is a natural born soul winner. There might be people who seem talented in that direction. You would probably say that an extrovert is going to have more success at talking to someone, right? Right and wrong. There are people as an extrovert that I can't reach because I run off the wrong way. There at Southwest, there's, a, there's a, a member there who's teaching somebody who's more introverted, and he's introverted, and they are doing great. The studies are going great. I tried talking to that guy, and he shut down. But that brother was able to go and talk to him. That brother was able to get that study. What's my point? My point is everybody can do it. It doesn't matter if you're extroverted or introverted. So it's not about... It's not about being extroverted or introverted. It's about actually getting out there and doing it. I love the way Bob, Brother Bobby Bates said it. Brother Bobby Bates said this. He said, I have read of mechanics, pilots, executives, engineers. I've heard of them dying. I've read about them dying, but I've never read of them being born. This means that somewhere along the way, they had to develop those capabilities or those abilities. And that holds true with evangelism. It's an ability that is developed. I, it's fair to say that I probably would never be an engineer. That, that kind of stuff doesn't work well with my brain, but there's people who can be because their brain works well with that. Not me, but it can be developed, right? If I wanted to, I could go and learn how to do it. And this being true, how can we overcome a lack of confidence? I would say ask to be part of personal Bible studies. Seek to gain experience. The old saying that experience is the best teacher is true. We, we gain confidence by learning and doing. To illustrate, it, to illustrate this truth, let's say it like this. Reading about flying is definitely helpful, but reading about flying 
is not going to qualify me to become a pilot, is it? No. You have to get out there. You have to you have to fly. You have to learn under someone. You know, I'm not going to go up in a plane by myself and fly it, right? You have to learn under somebody. They're going to teach you how to do it. And it's until we start flying with the help of those pilot trainers, we're never going to be pilots. And until we get out there with a Christian who knows how to evangelize, we're never going to become, become good at it. So the point is, is we need people who are able to do it and those who are able to train other people or Christians to do that very thing. And remember that you are growing as you are doing it. And this leads to the third point of the challenge of experience, the lack of realistic expectation. The lack of realistic expectation. I, I found this response to be very interesting and it might be you. you. You might have these same thoughts. You might have these same feelings. It may be that you expect that everyone you teach to become a Christian. Is that realistic? No. I remember in my first Bible study in Johnson City that I was excited. i have been talking to this guy and people around him for almost six months a year. Finally got the opportunity to serve him. Went over and helped him with it. his AC and after that, we were just connected and well, I said, let's get a Bible study. And we had a Bible study and everything was going great. He understood everything. She understood everything, the, the wife. And then at the end of the study, they said, we can't do this. This is not for us. Hard. It might have been that I expected them to be saved before I even gave them the opportunity to fully understand. You need to understand the, the expectations that are placed, that God puts out there, but understanding that not everybody is going to be saved. It may be that you expect that the people that you teach, and they are baptized, it might be that you expect them to be faithful Christians. Is that realistic? No. What, what parable comes to our mind? The parable of the sower, right? Or the parable of the four soils. Jesus tells us that some people are going to accept the word, but they're, they're not going to have enough fruit. They're not going to endure. Jesus tells us that some people are going to accept the word, but the, the cares of this world are going to choke them out. So even though we tilled the ground and we planted and we watered, all those things, even though we did all those things, you need to understand that the expectation of evangelism is planting and helping them grow and teaching after that you plan. It may be that there seems to be an expectation that there's no middle ground. Some people believe that's either your experience or you're not. But listen to me, what we do right now matters. Whether you've taught 100 people or if you're gonna teach the first person in your life, it matters. You know, I know this, this man back in Johnson City, over 80 years old. One day he was upset, a little bit sad. And he was upset with himself because in his 80 years of being a Christian almost, grew up in the church, he had never taught someone the gospel. But I told him, even if you taught somebody something today, it would matter, right? And so this leads to this expectations of God. If we're going to overcome these expectations, we need to have a realistic expectation of what God expects. God expects us to do what we are supposed to be doing. I find it interesting that nowhere in the scriptures do you ever find God judging us for somebody else's work or somebody else's actions, right? In Mark 13, verse 32-36, a passage that has to do with the Lord's second coming, Jesus said this, he said, take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when he is coming. And this is what he goes on to say, it's like in verse 34. He says, it's like a man who goes to a far country, who has left his house, he gave authority to his servants, and he says, and to each his work. To each servant his own work. And then he commanded the doorkeeper to keep watch. According to this passage, every Christian has their own work to do. But the question is, 
Well, when Jesus comes back, is he going to find us sleeping or working? Right? Every Christian has a seed to plant somewhere when it comes to evangelism. We all said already that there's 10 people you know that are not Christians. You have 10 seeds right there to plant. But it takes work. Now, for the sake of time, we're not going to cover the passage on the, on the body of Christ, but we understand that each person has a role to play in the church or the function of the body. So if it's the case that we're to focus upon what we are doing individually, then we need to keep a good attitude. Look at this passage. Look at 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, and I understand in context, he's talking to Timothy. He's a young preacher, and he's encouraging him. But I want to take this encouragement, and I want to give it to both the old and the young. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. Notice what he says to him. He told the young evangelist, Timothy, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. In other words, Timothy, do what you are supposed to be doing. But Timothy, understand some people are going to look down. But Timothy, do what you're supposed to be doing. Be an example to who? Who does he say? The believers. Be an example to the Christians. How? In the way you live, in the way you love, in your attitude, in the way you serve. Be the example. How great would it be here, Southwest, Odom, Mathis, if every Christian there did their own work and were striving to be examples to all of the other Christians? It'd be great, right? You know, one of the greatest things about Southwest right now with evangelism is because of the success that we've had, many other people who have decided that they wanted to learn how to do it. They want to learn how to become, how to teach people the gospel. For my evangelism lesson tomorrow evening, we'll talk about how in the past year we've had 45, 46 baptisms as the work of Southwest. But in congregation, 23, 24, possibly a couple more coming up if they obey in the past year. But because of that, a lot of other Christians have said, how can I help? How can I do it? How can I teach someone? And I always tell them, you have your contacts. Help me talk to your contacts and I'll help you, right? We'll, we'll sit down and study with them. But my point is, is if we can all be that example to one another to evangelize and to teach people the gospel, then we'll help one another, lead other people to, to heaven. Finally, uh, in our lesson, the challenge of environment. The challenge of environment. Whenever we consider this challenge, hey, we went 10, 10 minutes over because of him, right? Matt, so I give extra 10 minutes? Yeah? Yeah, okay. So the challenge of environment. When we consider this challenge, immediately we may think about a lack of personal relationships. A lack of personal relationships. For those who have maybe only Christian friends or a Christian environment, it's hard to evangelize because that's what, that's what our group is, our connections are. And so it could be very uncomfortable to go and talk to someone who is a complete stranger. Maybe we don't know how to initiate a conversation, but allow, allow me to ask you, did Jesus and his disciples know everybody that they taught? I would say no. Look at Acts 8 verse 1. Acts 8 verse 1. Obviously Jesus went to places where he didn't know people. Jesus went to Samaria. He didn't know the women. I mean, he did because he's God, but he didn't really ever meet her, right? Same thing with us, right? Acts 8 verse 1. Notice what it says about the first century Christians. He says, now Saul was consenting to his death at that time, a great persecution arose against the 
the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So you have Christians scattered, and notice verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went where? He says, everywhere preaching the word. Notice that. They were being persecuted. They were scattered, but they still went everywhere preaching the word. Do we, do we really think that all of these disciples had a personal relationship with somebody that's in Thessalonica or Rome or wherever it may have been that they went? Did they know anybody there? Probably not. They were leaving their homes to go somewhere because they were being persecuted. They go somewhere they were not familiar with, probably. Places that they did not know people at. And so we have to think about that as well when it comes to the challenge of environment. So how can we overcome the lack of personal relationships? We must consciously look for the opportunities. We must consciously look for the, the opportunities. And being converted, a good brother of ours uh, there at Southwest told me something that stuck in his mind. And in sticking in his mind, I think about this almost daily. This is what he, what he said. When, before he became a Christian, the person who taught him told him this. True Christianity is a thinking religion. True Christianity is a thinking religion. We are to think about the truth of God's word. Is what is being taught the truth? We are to think about our actions. What I am doing is, is it in accordance with God's will. And when it comes to evangelism, we have to think about how we initiate conversations with people. We have to think about how can I make a relationship or extend a, a, an olive branch to this person? How can I teach them the gospel? This means that we have to be prepared, yes, but this also means that we need to be friendly and create conversations. You know, as Christians, if we're people who are always rude, if we're people who are always inconsiderate, then we're going to have a hard time reaching people with the gospel of Christ. I love the way one person said it. They said, some people can brighten a whole room by simply walking out. <laughs> Don't be that person. If you ever, if you ever get to spend time with the Elims, that's a, that's a very bright house. That's funny. <laughs> it's a good time. Be, be kind. Be friendly. Be Christians. Now, when it comes to the challenge of environment, there's also the lack of time. The lack of time. The truth is we may not consider about how we spend our time. We love to go to sports events, right? We love to maybe go to community events, especially in smaller towns where, where everybody knows everybody for the most part, right? But a lot of times when we're there, we want to watch the game. And, and I understand why. We want to enjoy it. But what if we enjoyed the, 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 the game and made a relationship with somebody or talked to somebody? You may not be saying, hey, let's study right here, right now. No, that's not what you're, you're doing. But what if you took that opportunity to sit by somebody you know and say, hey, I had a good time sitting by you. How would you like to come over to the house for dinner next Friday? Bring, bring them on over, let them have dinner with you, and ask them maybe some personal religious, religious questions. And ask him, hey, would you like to study the Bible with me? Right? My, my, my point is, is those are things we have to think about. Because if we're not careful, whenever we're at these events or at these games or whatever it may be, we get caught up in that more than we get caught up in thinking about souls, about teaching people. You know, I love, I love going to the gym. And... Uh, Again, the dad bod, obviously a little bit, but that comes with being a dad. But I love going to the gym. And while I'm there, I'm talking to people. I'm trying to say, hey, you know, I, I met a guy at the gym recently who, um, his family's from China. And whenever I made some connections with him, he knew some of my friends who work at Chick-fil-A. And then I find out that this guy has a Chinese restaurant. His family has a Chinese restaurant. Uh, China Dynasty. I, Cody got some free food from him one time too because I, <laughs> because I met him. I met him. I got to talk to him. 
And since I moved back to Jaffa City, I mean, sorry, when I moved to Jaffa City, I lost connection. But when I moved back, I saw him at the gym, picked up real quick, and I get free food still. <laughs> but I also have extended to him the invitation to have dinner with me. And I'm waiting for him and his wife to find a good time. They, his mom, his mom's mom just passed away in China, so they went back over there. Um, and so I'm waiting to have dinner with them. But when I have dinner with them, I'm going to talk to him. What's interesting is my mind was thinking, man, I'm going to have to deal with Buddhism in some way. And one day, as we were just talking at the gym, he said, yeah, the church I go to uh, down the road. I was like, wait, church? And he was like, yes, church. And I was like, uh, oh, where do you go? Some big denominational church downtown Austin. But um, I would have never known that unless I was talking to him. And ever since then, we've had more religious conversations. But he's on my target list. He's one of my 10 that I'm trying to teach. But again, my point is, when you're at places and you're doing things, make sure you're utilizing that time. Consider how you use that time as, as uh, the, the, in the letter to Ephesians as the Apostle Paul said it. He says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fool, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil, therefore... Do not be wise, I'm uh, sorry, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So here we learn that if we're going to be wise in the Lord, if we're going to walk circumspectly, then we need to consider how we use our time. And so as we wrap this up, I got four minutes to wrap up. The challenge of establishment. Not something we're going to spend a lot of time on, but this is what I want to say. The reason why we're not established in teaching people the gospel may simply be this, a lack of caring about souls. A lack of caring about souls. Some people simply do not understand or maybe they've never felt the obligation of the Great Commission. Some people simply don't understand that when Jesus said, go out into all the world and baptize people and teach them, uh, I mean, baptizing the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then continue to teach them, some people don't understand that that's for them too. Or Mark 16, 15, right? But then I ask myself, well, well what's, the, what's the main issue? Maybe what's the main heart part of it? It might be this. It might be the fact that we don't care about our own soul. That's rough. That's a straight way of say, saying it. But why would we care? Why would we expect other people to receive Christ if we're not even walking, being rooted in Him? Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. Why would we expect non-Christians to forsake the world if we're not if we're not willing to exchange the world for our own soul? Point simple. Why would we care about another person's soul if we do not even care about our own soul? Right? We believe we're saved. You know what, you know what the Hebrew writers told, told the, the Hebrew Christians in believe chapter 4? He said some of them were not able to enter into the land of rest because of unbelief. And he equates that with obedience in that same context. Paul just said that if we believe we speak so consequently if we don't believe and we don't speak then what's the conclusion we don't enter into the promised rest heaven eternal it might be that we don't go out and teach people because we really don't care about our own soul it's a straight forward long way to say it but we we probably should consider that what about this one a lack of Bible study commitment. Why would we care about anybody to come and study the Word of God with us and to really want to, to, to desire it and hunger for it if we don't even have that same desire and hunger for it? How many of us have maybe personal Bible study uh, for ourselves? Times scheduled for, for, for every day or maybe every other day, whatever it may be. If we don't, then why do we expect other people to have that love and desire for God's word if we don't, right? 
you're not caught on, the reason why we ended our study with this challenge is this, is that whenever we are, whenever we are established and caring about souls and commitment to Bible study, then that challenge of exclusion, experience, environment will be easier to deal with because we will be established in each and one of these causes. Therefore, friends, the choice is going to be ours. Are we going to be established in Christ and his word, or are we going to basically drift away, neglect? So as we close, allow me to end with this thought. God asks this question to every Christian in Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him who they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Friends, if we refuse or neglect to obey Christ in the great commission of his covenant, many of our friends, many of our neighbors, many of our loved ones will be lost eternally because they cannot obey and become saved if they do not hear. And that's why we need to take it personally. Because we are the ones who teach them. If there's any need to come forward this evening, come forward. I'm oh, sorry, are we extending an invitation? No? Thank you. <laughs>